I love to live and work in the presence of this wonderful painting by my husband, which is called Cosmos, because to me it represents everything that is trying to break through to us from the universe in this great explosion that he shows in the middle with the pointed lines coming from the center. And also he shows all the elements which are invisible to us in this dimension, but which are all present in the cosmos, waiting to be recognized by us. So out of this matrix, this um, violet matrix in the background, is coming this explosion of the, the impulse to awaken. That's what I see this painting as, an expression of the impulse to awaken from the unconsciousness that we've been living in for so long, the prison that we've been living in with wrong ideas about our presence on the planet and not connected to the divinity that we are and that really reaches out to us from this painting in such an extraordinary and moving way. I think we're moving through a crucial stage of transition between one age and another. All around us there's depravity, barbarism, dreadful sights and situations. But at the same time, we are faced with a huge opportunity for evolutionary advance. Something is trying to come through to us from the cosmos, something that is represented by my husband's painting, something that is asking for our attention and is offering us help, help from the cosmos itself. I just want to read you something, something that Albert Schweitzer said when he was given the Nobel Prize for Peace in November 1954. He really addressed the problem of our moral immaturity in relation to the superman power of our weapons and our general sort of culture. And he said this, he said, the superman suffers from a fatal flaw. He has failed to rise to the level of superhuman reason to match his superhuman strength. Because he lacks it, the conquest of science and technology become a mortal danger to him rather than a blessing. The essential fact is that we are becoming inhuman to the extent that we become supermen. We have learned to tolerate the facts of war, that men are killed en masse, that whole cities and their inhabitants are annihilated by bombs, that men are turned into living torches by incendiary bombs. It is my profound conviction that the solution lies in our rejecting war for an ethical reason, namely that war makes us guilty of inhumanity. What I'd like to do in this talk is to give you a summary of what's in this book, The Dream of the Cosmos, that took me 20 years to write. The cosmos means the whole, but by that I mean the universe, really. We've lost our connection to the universe, and we need to regain it if we're not to proceed down the path towards self-destruction that we're on at the moment. Millions of people across the planet are working devoting their lives to helping the planet and helping each other. Millions of others are sound asleep and have not woken to the urgency of the situation that we're in and the fact that we have to make a choice, a choice between going along the same path that we're on or leaving it and returning to the path that we were on many thousands of years ago, a path that the shamanic cultures have kept to this day without deviating from it. And that is that they've realized that the Earth is a sacred planet and that we are really the servants of this planet. We're not the people who can control and direct the life of the planet. We really have to serve it um, in the most humble kind of way. And the people who are helping are growing all the time, which is absolutely marvelous. But there's a need to wake up to a new story a new story that could take us forward, take us away from past behaviors, take us away from this whole scenario of endless war and building of 
um, demonic weapons onto a path of love and service and into a new civilization that we could create if we all came together to do this. So what I want to convey to you is, first of all, in this new story, that we have to relinquish some aspect of the old stories. And we've got two old stories. One is the uh, Christian myth of the fall, which gave us the idea and has imprinted us with the idea that we are sinful beings who can't really do anything right and that we are, can only be saved by the sacrifice of the Son of God. But this is not true because we carry within ourselves the ability to redeem ourselves. Indeed, we have to redeem ourselves. We can't leave it to Christ. And the fact that we have left it to Christ has meant that we haven't really woken up to the fact of what we have to do, the work that we need to do. The second story is the scientific one, the materialist scientific one, that this material reality is the only reality, that there is nothing beyond it, that there's no consciousness in the universe, that it is without purpose or meaning or direction. The second story gives us the idea that what's the point of doing anything? We're just all alone on this planet. Um, it's up to us to do what we want with it, to direct it as we please. And there's no other um, entity or civilization in the universe which could connect with us or help us. This, in fact, has not, is not correct. I know it's the story that's been put forward by science at the moment, but shamanic societies have been in touch with other civilizations in the universe for thousands of years. They've journeyed to these other dimensions. They've met the inhabitants of them. And it's nonsense to say that uh, we are the only inhabitants of the universe and that we have to wait maybe thousands of years before we meet any other entities. So that's one thing I wanted to get clear, that there are two stories we need to relinquish, one the religious story and the other the materialist scientific story. Then we need to turn to the new story, which in fact science is helping us to formulate because it's giving us the idea that the whole universe is connected. Everything is connected with everything else. There's no atom of life that isn't connected with every other atom. So we are beings which are already connected with each other and with all the life of the planet and with all the life of the cosmos. And if we could only realize that, we would stop all our stupid wars and our struggles for power and our battles to gain one step up over somebody else. It's just ludicrous. The whole thing is a ludicrous scenario that we've got ourselves into and we have to come out of it as quickly as we possibly can. Now, the other point that I wanted to make, very important, is that we are divine beings. We are not fallen sinful beings. We are divine beings. We carry the divinity of spirit within every atom of our body, and so does the whole cosmos, the whole universe. Everything is a divine unity. And for that reason, the earth is sacred. And this is something that has not occurred to the people who are making the weapons and thinking of uh, killing other people with them that really, even in splitting the atom, this was an act of sacrilege against matter. And the reason matter was able to be treated in that way was because in the religions of the last 2,000 years, all the emphasis has been put on spirit. Spirit is something transcendent. Spirit is something different from us. Spirit far away. Spirit we could pray to for help. Spirit that would judge us. This was the image of God that we created, not God created, we created it. And we can change this uh, concept of God. We can understand that God is not something uh, distant and tran utterly transcendent to us, but he is or she is the, the ground of our being and we are part of him or her. We are an intrinsic part of the divinity that lives through us, in us, and uh, in all the life around us. That is something so important to get through that I don't know how to stress it more than I'm doing. You are divine beings. We are divine beings, all of us. And we have a responsibility to act in such a way as we help and love and cherish all the life around us rather than acting in a destructive and um, blind and unconscious way. We have to up the level of our consciousness
get into a new act, get into this new story, and bring it to life in our culture in whatever way we can. The Greek philosopher Parmenides, long ago, 600 BC, he said, uh, we are divine beings having a human experience. And he was absolutely right. That's what we're doing. But we don't know it. <laughs> so I hope that the few words that I'm saying will help you to know you are part of the divinity of life and everything around you. And the capacity to love and to cherish that we have for each other, for our animals. Think of your dog or your cat whom you love. And uh, think of your children whom you work for and, and help to grow up. All that love comes to us from the love of the universe, from the love of God, the love of spirit. So we carry that capacity for creative love within us in everything we do. We also carry the capacity to destroy, and we can use that divine power to destroy. And that's what we've done with the creation of our demonic weapons, diabolical weapons, I should say. But we're so blinded by the unconsciousness of our culture that we can't see that they are demonic and that really they pollute the earth and that the earth needs to have them lifted off it and um, if we can get rid of them, even the um, destructive residue of them, that is what we should be doing. As part of our divinity, we need to know that we're beings of light, that light is the actual ground of everything that we are. We're permeated with light, saturated with light. We can't see that light. We see the light of the sun, but we don't see the, the, the quantum vacuum or the quantum plenum light, which surrounds us, permeates us, and connects all of us. We're connected to each other through light, through a great net of light. In India, this is called the net of Indra, was always known about by the great Indian sages, but it's been forgotten in the West. So now I think science is actually recovering this for us, that we're connected through light. And imagine us within, living within a great network or web of shimmering, scintillating, sparkling elements of light, and that this is something that is conscious. I think we should remember that we are as it were, embraced by this wonderful net of light that permeates every atom of our being and every atom of the universe that we see. And it's really something that loves us like a mother would love us. It's conscious. It's where our consciousness comes from. But uh, we don't know anything about it, really. So it's time to bring this back, bring back the net of Indra and the image of the shimmering web of light that surrounds us all and permeates us all. As part of the divinity that we are, I need also to talk about the subject of death, because the fact that death is never discussed in our culture is one of the great neuroses of our time. People need to understand that when we die, we don't die. We go on into other dimensions. The scientific idea that we've been indoctrinated with is that consciousness dies with the death of the physical brain. But this is not true because consciousness does not begin in the physical brain. It is transmitted through the physical brain or transduced through the physical brain. It comes from the consciousness of the whole universe. That is the origin of consciousness. So I wanted to make that absolutely clear. When we die, we don't die. We move on to other dimensions. And this should lift a huge burden from people's hearts because the greatest grief we can experience in our life is to lose a parent or to lose a child or for a child to lose its parents when it's very young. And this is something that we could tell our children that death is not the end, that they will see their parent again and tell parents that they will see their son or daughter, perhaps even a son or daughter who's committed suicide, as so much recent uh, young people do. This is something we need to know as a fact, that we survive death. There is a great deal of mental illness in our culture, as you know, but nobody asks where it comes from. We treat it with drugs, 
we regret it when it happens. We are um, sad and, and worried when it happens to us, when we can't escape from it, so to speak. But where does it come from? I think it comes from the imbalance in our culture between the masculine and the feminine archetypes or principles. The fact that our culture is totally dominated by the masculine principle and the feminine has been left out of the picture altogether. And this is very bad for our psyche because we're made up of two components. With all of us, men and women, have masculine and feminine in our nature. We have the deep matrix of consciousness, uh, which is the what, what Jung called the unconscious, which is the feminine root of our being, just like the mother holds a child in her womb for nine months before it's born into the world. She is the matrix of that child during the nine months. And we are held in the matrix of the unconscious aspect of our nature the whole time. And you can call the unconscious aspect of our nature the soul, if you like, but that would perhaps get us into uh, difficulties to explain what the soul is, which I can't do for the moment. You'll have to read my book. What I really am saying is that the feminine principle, and here I'm going to bring forth this first example of the feminine, which comes from the Paleolithic. I call it a goddess um, because it seems to me that the person who made it was making something numinous and something very meaningful to him or her. But that feminine principle, which we have images of 25,000 years ago, has got lost. And the reason it got lost was that, was that all the emphasis of our teaching, our religious teaching, was put on the transcendent male deity. And that those religions got rid of the feminine aspect of deity a long time ago. And they even got rid of the feminine aspect of the Holy Spirit at the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century AD. So that was the last element of the feminine that came through from the old goddesses, the ancient goddesses of the um, ancient civilizations. Goddesses like Isis, goddesses like Artemis or Kybele, um, or Athena or Aphrodite. These were all known and very precious to the people of the uh, cultures in which they were worshipped. And we've completely lost that with the exception of the Virgin Mary, who is not part of the Godhead. So we've lost the balance of the male and female aspects of deity, with the exception of Kabbalah. That is the only exception to this, uh, where the male and female aspects are in union with each other and bring creation forth out of that union. Such a beautiful image, which we have lost in the patriarchal religions. So I want to emphasize what happens when a culture has no feminine principle what happens is that both men and women are, as it were, driven or possessed by the masculine principle. There is no other one to balance it. And so they act in their lives as if they were driven by this yang energy, where the yin energy has no power, no influence. There's no way it can get in. So that is why there's such mental illness in our culture, because it affects children in the way we bring them up, the way we educate them. It affects young people going out to look for jobs. They feel they have to achieve, they have to get somewhere. They lose the capacity to just live their lives in sheer wonder, in sheer enjoyment of the experience of being alive. And they're forced on in this sort of straitjacket of having to achieve far too young with all the exams that we make them go through. And they lose all sorts of aspects of their late nature, creative aspects like the ability to to paint or to play music or to dance or to sing or to act or to do things with their hands like making things and carpentry and things. All that is simply cut out of their education when they reach secondary education. And their souls, I'm speaking of soul here as the creative element of our being, has no outlet, no way of expressing itself. It's forced into the straitjacket of the rational mind. And that is not good for, for children growing up, and it leads eventually to mental illness, to depression, to uh, bipolar symptoms, and even to schizophrenia, I think. It's not something that's innate, genetic in us. It's something that we impose on children as they grow up. So what have we created in our modern culture, which is giving so much stress to so many people but most particularly our children, who have to grow up 
learning this new technology as well as passing all these exams and trying to keep up with everything that's changing all the time, not having both parents probably in the home to talk to about it all, and confused, and many of them become depressed and frightened and anxious, and eventually they develop depression and even suicide because nobody listens to them. Nobody listens to the fact of their distress and the fact that this inflated mind that we've developed which is so disconnected from the depths and so disconnected from any shred of wisdom is driving us all along a path which is leading us to ultimate destruction if we don't change course. What is happening is that there's a continuous um, advance, if you like, in a linear sense, but there's no uh, um, progress in depth. There's no wisdom coming into the culture. There's nothing that looks below the surface. Everything just goes along the surface in superficial ways, superficial values, superficial tele television programs, superficial ideas that are discussed endlessly, uh, superficial um, directives that are given to us and to children. And all this creates great stress because people feel something is wrong. People feel their lives are not really being lived to the fullest extent that they could be and they feel unhappy and they feel depressed and that's really why a lot of depression comes into being uh, because there's no one to listen to the fact that they're not unhappy in the depths of themselves and so this stress really affects children above all because children have no one to turn to who can listen to the fact that they don't understand why they're put into the mis this machine which says they have to pass exams and then they have to get a job and then they have to be successful in the job and then they have to do this, that and the other. And they have no time to reflect on what they're doing on this planet and what their true role on the planet might be. What could it be if they weren't in this um, squirrel in a cage thing of always having to succeed and, and um, do what they're told to do, etc., etc.? At the heart of the cosmos is a love of unimaginable dimensions that holds all of us in its embrace. All people, all elements, all animals on this planet are in this great embrace of love. Now, if we told this new story to our children, how much more love and confidence would it give them instead of being frightened of living and going into depressions, they would rejoice at being alive. They would really be happy that they were born. They would love animals as they do anyway, but they would love everything more and they would understand the reason for loving everything more, which is that this love that they experience comes to them from the love of the cosmos for them. As part of entering this new story, we need to move away from the patriarchal concept of God as a distant, transcendent creator and become aware that we are part of the divinity that we've been worshipping for thousands of years. That really is so important to realize that we are part of this divinity we've been worshipping. We're not separate from it. And also to realize that we've been missing the mother. There's no mother in any culture. There's God the Father, but there's no God the Mother. And this is a great lack because it means women are not valued for their role as mothers. It means they have to distort their lives into becoming uh, business people perhaps or getting on to the ladder of climbing the road to success, which is very much against their nature because their nature is to nurture and to contain, to hold and to, to love and cherish. And if they're suddenly put on this uh, bandwagon of having to succeed, having to get up the uh, greasy pole, so to speak, um, too young, they can do it later on, but not when they're children and in their teens. It's too young. And so they become imbalanced at a very early age. And the lack of the mother pervades the whole culture right the way through in the disrespect for women that we can see all around, the, the envy of women for other women who have achieved the supposed success that we should be seeking. Children don't have anyone to greet them when they come home from school. There's no one to talk to. So how can they develop language? How can they develop feeling and empathy if there's no mother in the house or if there's no feminine support for their very fragile souls? What happens to the soul in this culture when there's no one to support it? Men and women, and above all children, are 
becoming victims of this very harsh competitive ethos which rules the culture. And women in trying to copy and being educated to copy the model of the masculine are doing great violence to their own nature. And what's happening is we're having a double dose of the masculine because women in trying to make themselves more like men um, are really neglecting their feminine nature and really obliterating it in their attempt to copy the model that they've been given. And if they don't stop, they really will destroy um, not only their own nature, but they'll destroy the feminine in men as well because men will be very frightened of this new image of woman who's like themselves and wants always to get to the top and compete. And that actually is a travesty of man's nature because it isn't that in its true self. Man's nature is really to protect. That's her, his true role is to protect. And woman's is to nurture. And so these two roles need to come together, the, the man and the woman, protecting and nurturing the life not only of their families and their children and their parents, but also the life of the whole planet. The feminine archetype has four aspects, nature, matter, soul, and body, most important body. These four aspects are the ones that have been neglected in the last 4,000 years, put down at the bottom of the pile, and not valued as aspects of spirit. But they are spirit just as much as any other aspect, just as much as God up in heaven. Nature got split off from spirit, and with that, the other elements of the feminine also got split off, that is soul and body, and matter that we were so happy to split in 1945. What happened when nature became separated from spirit during the Christian era was that nature, soul, body, and woman were downgraded in relation to mind, spirit, and the male. That's terribly important. And darkness and evil became associated with matter, woman, and the body. The body was treated appallingly during the Christian era, appallingly. So woman was then named as the inferior gender and treated accordingly by man. And we're only just recovering from that whole programming of 2,000 years. So these four elements of the feminine need to be brought together again and valued. And the body needs to be valued as the vehicle of the soul and as the vehicle of spirit on this material level because we need bodies to live in this level on this planet. And we were given bodies in order to do that. Our body, our soul, which includes our heart, which is the vehicle of the soul, our mind and our spirit need to be regarded as a single organism, not as split off elements which don't belong to each other. They all hang together just as we all are connected to each other. So never talk about mind without including soul. Never talk about spirit without including body. The way we use body today is simply deplorable. First of all, we use it in all our sexual uh, relationships casually, thinking that it's something that we can use to direct according to what we want. We'll just choose this woman or that man, have a one night stand and go on to the next one. That is acting without any awareness of the soul or the spirit. It's just acting blindly on the purely physical level not valuing the body as the precious temple of the soul. So that's one very important thing I want to get across because this whole contempt for the body has come into our culture very recently. The obsession with sexuality at the most uh, blatant, unconscious level has spread all over the world. And it's destroying people's lives. And it's destroying women's lives and children's lives and men's lives. Why does nobody challenge it? Why does nobody say sexuality is a sacred act? Something between a man and a woman who love each other and who show devotion to each other. Why, I ask. What's happened in the last few centuries with the technological advance, which has been so extraordinary and which has transformed our lives, given us the internet, which is an amazing advantage, as well as also a disadvantage in some ways. But what's happened with the emphasis on technological advance 
is that we've suffered a catastrophic loss of soul because of the loss of the feminine and the emphasis on the masculine drive to ever further achievement, ever further heights of artificial intelligence, robotic intelligence, etc. This is so important that we recover our soul and we recover the feeling values, the heart values that go with soul. And those values are harmony, truth, beauty, and justice. And those were the ones that were always associated with the feminine principle in ancient civilizations and have somehow got lost or distorted in our own culture. We've gone too far along that path without being balanced. And because of that, we've lost we've lost our soul virtually. Many people don't realize they have a soul. And this is something that I've tried to bring back in my book, which is so important, which shows how everything is connected through soul and how important it is. It's our kind of higher consciousness or higher awareness. And we can move into that higher awareness if we move out of survival instincts, which are driving all this power business in the world driving the, 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 the need for more and more weapons and greater and greater weapons, more and more power, move out of this into the soul values of harmony, justice, and peace, and beauty, which must not be forgotten. Beauty is a very important element of the soul qualities, which were always recognized in ancient civilizations. Nothing that was created that was not beautiful. And where is our beauty in today's culture? If we look around us, where is the beauty of our buildings? Where is the beauty of our cities? There just isn't any. It's all huge skyscrapers, harsh environment, no trees, and miserable lives for the people who have to live in them. So that's one very important aspect of the loss of the feminine, and the loss of soul, and the danger of too much technological advance People are not aware of the dangers of this technology. They're going too fast, and that's the masculine yang energy driving it on without being balanced by the yin containing feminine energy, which might give, us, give it some balance. Where is the harmony? Where is the justice for the poor of the world and all the people that we really want to help but find so much difficulty helping? And what's happened is that the rational mind has virtually replaced God. We've got get rid of God, we've got rid of the soul, and we're left with the rational mind. And that's all we need, we're told, in order to uh, progress, always the word progress, towards our goals. The rational mind has replaced God. And in its one-eyed stance, it's banished the non-rational, the mysterious, the... I don't know what to call it really, all the side of life that we haven't explored. We've just shut it out as being irrelevant. So that's what the rational mind has done and that's why we've lost touch with our soul. And it's really a one-eyed consciousness. We've lost the other eye. That's terribly important. You might say we've lost the eye of the right hemisphere and we're being directed and driven by the uh, consciousness of the left hemisphere alone. And that's very important that we bring back the balance between the two hemispheres of the brain and the two ways of looking at life. One is really the visionary imagination and the other is the logical, linear and very necessary component to our consciousness. But we need both. We can't just have one without the other. This inflated stance of the rational mind used to be called hubris by the Greeks. And they uh, explained it very clearly in their great plays, the danger of hubris but we seem to have forgotten the word, and the danger of inflation, because this is a consciousness that is out of balance and really um, is in great danger of going down a path that will lead us to our own destruction, the destruction of our species, because the planet won't put up with our presence forever if we go on this path. There are many things like fracking, for instance, that are wrong because they are infringing the sacredness of the earth. They're paying no attention to the Earth's feelings, if you like. Can you imagine any scientist realizing that the Earth has feelings, has a consciousness, and is aware of what we're doing to it? So this is all part of the inflation of the rational mind, which says it can do anything it wants. and doesn't matter about it doing these kind of things. The new story is about recognizing that we live on a sacred planet, 
that every aspect of life on it is sacred, including ourselves. From this perspective, all weapons and all acts that destroy the preciousness of life and the precious sacrality of life are wrong, and we have to recognize that they're wrong. All the weapons that we're creating to destroy life, because in actually making them, we're imagining the destruction of life. The act of imagining in itself is an act which is happening, which is affecting the life of the earth. All the people that are being killed in dreadful places like Aleppo, for instance, that we saw terrible scenes there. All the people who are struggling for power, the governments who are struggling for power and through conquering and bombing and destroying the lives of people. This is sacrilege. This is evil. It's not one power conquering another, so to speak, or one country conquering another. It's demonic behavior. And I really want to get that across because I think all the people who are involved in these wars, who are involved in um, imagining new weapons, even more terrible than what we've got now, they're engaged in demonic activity, but they don't know it because they're doing it for the governments who are employing them or for the um, leaders who want to have greater power or whatever reason it is. So we need time to reflect. We need time to rest. We need time to go deep into ourselves. And we need time to ask, where is the vision that could lead us? Do you remember there's that old biblical saying, without, without vision the people perish? Well, we're perishing because there's no vision. And where are the leaders who could give us this vision? There are many leaders like Deepak Chopra in America, like um, the Dalai Lama. But do we listen to him? Do we listen to what he's teaching us? That we really have to give up these weapons? That we have to love each other? So I think this is so important that we get uh, through into our consciousness the fact that we can be different. We can live in a different way. We can create a different civilization based on really true values that uh, respect each other, that don't harbor hatred and revenge, that um, treat children as miracles of divine being that have been blessed by coming into our lives and we have been blessed by receiving them. And how we treat them is of the greatest importance to the well-being of their lives, to how they develop into um, caring adults. Uh, all the cruelty, all the abuse of children, really this is part of the noxious substratum, shadow aspect of our culture, which is not really addressed and recognized sufficiently. So I'm talking about a change of consciousness that's possible, viable, within our grasp, that has to be taken. There is a Shakespeare uh, um, sentence that comes back to me. Uh, there is a tide in the affairs of man which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Neglected, all the journey of our life is spent in shallows and in miseries. I've misquoted a bit, but that gist of that wonderful sentence that he gave really should direct us all We've got to take the tide that leads to a better fortune, a better life for every single being on this planet, every single animal on this planet, every single creature on this planet. We can do it. We have the power to change course. We must change course. We have the choice. We have the choice between going on as we are and really listening to the voice of the wisdom within us, something that is trying to speak to us from the depths of our soul, something that needs to be reintegrated into our conscious mind and honored and listened to. We're perishing because we've really gone too far in one direction without balancing head with heart, without balancing left and right hemispheres of the brain, and without balancing the need for relationship with the fascination with technology and all the discoveries that are being made, but it needs to be held in balance. The masculine and feminine principles need to be held in balance. This is a challenge that we can rise to meet. It's a challenge that's been offered to us, first of all, by the universe itself, because we're all part of the universe, but also by the fact that we've come into this time of tremendous choice, which is also a movement between one age and another. And we have the choice of creating a new kind of civilization
based on new values, not the values of power and success, but the values of love and service. And those values could be the guides or the guide lights that we need. And I think we really have to take the tide now, the current when it serves. We have to go with the tide which is leading us to a new consciousness. Leave the old consciousness about power and domination behind. Leave all these terrible weapons of mass destruction behind. And start on a new foot. Get, get into a new app. Live the new story. Breathe the new story and carry this into as many lives as possible all over the planet. And with that strength, which we have the strength and we have the intelligence and we have the wisdom innate within us, we can do it. We can really get over this terrible uh, hump that we're in or on. <laughs> we can move into a new civilization and we can help each other to do this and serve the planet instead of dominating the planet. So the elements of a new story are this, that we have a new image of God, that we have a new image of death, that we have a new image of our purpose on this planet, which is to serve it. The new story is about divine spirit pouring life into manifestation through all our lives and through every aspect of life on this planet. The new story is about relinquishing the fear of death, knowing that we survive death, that we are immortal beings. We are divine beings carrying divinity, the pearl of great price that Jesus taught us about in every cell of our being. So that pearl of great price is within us. It's not something to be sought without us. We have to find that indwelling or innate divinity, realizing what it is, and serve it in life, give it expression in life, because it changes our whole concept of what we're doing on this planet. It tells us that we have a purpose, that we have a function, that we have an um, agenda to accomplish, and that is to carry out the will of the cosmos on this planet and to help this planet retain its wonderful life, to cherish every aspect of its divinity, 